All right, this is Purple Politics today. We have Travis Clark in the place, uh, the lead pastor or kind of co-lead pastor with, with your wife at Canvas Church in San Francisco. Uh, this, this man has been someone who I've looked up to for a while now. Uh, absolutely the best pastor that I've ever had in my life has brought me into faith in a space that I never experienced um, God in that way before. You've created such a great community up there in San Francisco in a place before I experienced that lacked a lot of my desires for having faith community. And then you really showed me how you can be one of God's guys in a different way. You can be a dude who just um, has sacrificed their life for the you know, for God's mission for you, but then you can also be a part of conversations of culture, conversations of politics, and you're willing to confront conversations in a way that I've never experienced before. So I'm really happy you're on here, Travis. Uh, thanks for taking some of your time. And how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing good. And thanks for the really kind words, man. And I appreciate it. And it's really cool to just uh, be in this space with you and, and talk about you know, things I'm really passionate about, you know, which is culture and, you know, how we can leave the world better than how we found it. So, you know, this is, this is super cool, man. Thanks for having me. I love it. So you are leading a church, a church community um, through these uncertain times. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that we never could have expected. The history folks will write about and they will view us as subjects of how did you not know or how could you have done this better? Um, and, and I think as a person, as a pastor, um, those, you know, expectations of you during these times are really high. Uh, mm -hmm. How have you been able to cope and what are you doing uh, to, to be able to educate yourself and, and walk through this with optimism, but also with um, trying to better your understanding? Yeah, yeah, man, that's a really good question. I mean, and, and for all of us, this is just new territory. And so anyone who, who pretends like they have it all together and all the answers, <laughs> you know, I just don't buy into it because yeah. none of us have walked through a pandemic before. And this wasn't a part of my seminary training on how to pass through a pandemic. And so right. um, I think if I'm honest, there's, there's a level of winging it of just kind of going one day at a time and being willing to be um, fluid and being willing to pivot when you need to. And sort of, uh, you know, what we've been telling our team is like, when we learn something new, we'll, we'll make decisions based on that, you know, and, and we're going to be okay with that really unpredictable um, process that this pandemic has led us into. And I don't know if that's unique to being a pastor. I think all of us are sort of doing that and adapting in, in that way. Um, but, you know, as far as pastoring a church through this, um, when you had your, you know, our services gone and our programs gone, like, what's been really beautiful about um, I guess this pandemic, and that sounds like an oxymoron to say, but something really great that's come out of this is that um, people have really realized their deep need for one another, you know, for community, for those uh, conversations that, to, to, you know, as good as the program might be, um, the program will never be better or more impactful than people. And so uh, what, what this pandemic has reminded us all about is the importance of community and, and that person on your left and on your right that can walk with you and talk with you. And, um, you know, I've used this metaphor before, be kind of sort of that human trash can you can throw up in every once in a while, because I think yeah. all of us have had those moments. And, um, and so I think that's what we've been trying to do is really, instead of just saying, hey, like, wait till the program starts again, we've been saying, hey, let's lean into people and let's be there for one another. Even if we can't be there in person, uh, you know, a text message, a phone call, a Zoom like this, you know, can make all the difference because at the end of the day, like we could probably live without the program, but we can't live without people. And right. uh, so that's sort of been our drum we've been hitting throughout this pandemic is, is how do we, um, you know, I know we call it social distancing and I, I understand that the heart behind it, it's more physical distancing because we, we do need the social, we do need the community. And I've been trying to encourage people to physically distance, but don't socially distance because you need people. A hundred percent. You know, I think that one of the principles of like what you've done within the community you lead is like your small group setting, you know, and, and really showing how within small faith groups, um, walking through the Bible together, but then also just walking through the seasons of life together. It's, yeah. it's a different, stronger experience of faith than you can probably ever have before. 
because yeah. I think trust really starts with showing up and showing up consistently. Yeah. And I think those are the principles that are, are founded in just having a, a, a group of 12 people that say, Hey, we're going to show up every single Tuesday night. Yeah. And, um, if I show up, you'll show up. And then throughout a nine month period of time, we're going to like totally learn more about each other. We're going to trust each other in a better way. That's something that I'm really having a, a difficult time with now. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's different levels of comfortability of what a small group looks like. Um, yeah. politics have, you know, kind of broke again into that space of where those conversations can be had and what's appropriate. Um, what are you all doing with, you know, trying to, are you creating those over Zoom? Or is there still settings where five people are able to get together? How are you encountering those types of um, discrepancies in, in this space? Yeah, so I mean, Zoom primarily has been our medium for, for yeah. people to gather, you know, I, and the reason behind that is mainly as a church, like we're really committed to being a good citizen here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we felt to be a good citizen, you know, we needed to honor the the guidelines and restrictions that the leadership of the city have put into place. And so um, Zoom was has been our primary medium. Uh, you know, we know of some groups that have sort of created a, a, a pod of sorts, you know, that they've said, hey, look, here's our rules of our pod. Um, here's how we're all committing to quarantine so that um, we mitigate the risks of spreading this infection even further. And uh, because they really wanted to meet with at least a few people in person. And that's actually been really helpful that we've seen communities of, you know, five, six or so say, hey, look, we're going to meet up in person. We're going to commit. We're going to make like these sacrifices personally because yeah. we know we really need community. Um, and so it's actually and it's actually really great because now you have a community built on mutual like sacrifice and selflessness. Yeah. And there's something really special about that. Right. When you're Absolutely. like, hey, we're here together and we all know we've sacrificed to be here and we've done it for one another. Um, I think great community never can never be built on what you get from one another. It's what you give. Yeah. Um, you know, no one likes, you know, if that person that shows up and you can tell they're, they're a taker. They just want to take, but they never want to give. Uh, and, and so that doesn't go uh, well. <laughs> yeah. It never goes well. It never ends well. And, and so that's actually been kind of cool that these pods and um, have cr almost forced there to be this selflessness at the center of their, of their community, which has made, I think a much healthier space. Um, but Zoom, these small pods, we are going to be um, stepping into uh, a more regular rhythm of, of connection uh, here in September where uh, we're going to be doing one week will be an online gathering that we've been doing for our services. And then the other week will actually be encouraging people to get in pods of people outside at a park, you know, still masked up and sure. you know, following the social distancing guidelines and everything. But, uh, but doing it outside, because at the end of the day, I think people need community more than they need my sermons every week. Like, I'm not going to kid myself and think like, oh, you just need to watch my sermon. And everything will be great. I think uh, they're helpful. But at the same time, I think there's something even more helpful about eye contact and laughter and hearing somebody else's voice, like not through a screen, but in person. And uh, so we're going to start fostering those spaces on a regular basis uh, here in September, as long okay. as the, the data of and sure. the leadership of our city support that. But for now they do. And uh, we're going to start to lean into that. Yeah. And I, you know, it's been an interesting conversation, like politically, right. Okay. And, and purple politics for me is a space that I don't think everything should actually be politicized. Sure. And the left and the right, the red and the blue like to always make every element of our life so political. So purple politics is kind of a place to poke fun at, the way that everything gets politicized a little bit, still mm -hmm. calling it politics at the end of this title, but realizing that everything shouldn't be that. And, um, and then offering space for, even if you are really politically left or right, there's still room, like, let's talk about it. And I think that the biggest problem that we're having right now in the United States is miscommunication. And it's really um, blocking the, the communication between heart to heart of what we all expect and want this country and our community and our personhood to be able to, to live within. And one of the things that I've seen is a lot of people having the expectation that 
churches were going to be the thing that break the bank on this coronavirus. They're like, well, all these Christians, they're still going to get together and they're going to, co- you know, you see sometimes these different posts where it's like, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. This coronavirus can't get me. Right. right and right. I've actually seen the opposite. Like I've seen churches really take on the strength of saying, you know what, we're going to do this with community. And you've really done that. You've been vocal about leading in that way and saying like, we're also citizens here. Like, and we need to act appropriately. Um, so I, I guess I thank you in, you know, showing up for the church community as a whole to, to show us all that not everybody's just this, these crazy lunatic Christians that aren't listening to some of the news. Yeah, 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 man. I think that's so important. Like, I've been encouraged by the number of churches that have really um, willingly laid down what their preferences are and even what their rights are. You know, I think there's some churches you can make a case like, Hey, look, we have the right to gather. We're going to like, just do what we want to do. Sure. But they're saying, Hey, like, we're going to, we're going to lay our rights down. And which I, I think like, if you're serious about Jesus, the story of Jesus is about how he laid down his rights for the sake of humanity. Right. You know? And I think so maybe one of the best ways you can live that out as a church is say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to lay down our preferences and our rights for the betterment of humanity. And I've been encouraged by how so many churches are doing that. Now, of course, those churches don't make the news because it's not good news. It's not entertaining news, right? right. You're going to get the, the kooky, crazy ones. And those churches exist and they're loud sure, um, yeah. and they make the news real. But um, I, I don't know. I guess that's probably the problem with social media and the way our the media in general works right now is like you get one little bit, one story. And we think that tells the whole story when we're like, that's just like one sentence. Of and the I've, whole story. I've, you know, everyone was always leading up to Easter when like the masks were all going to be off and you're yeah. going to see pictures of thousands of people at these mega churches. Yeah. That picture never showed up on the front never page happened. of the news. Yeah. So it, it, and it was forgot about pretty quickly that like that didn't happen. Right. You know, I think most people acted responsibly. I think that still, there is some communities that are still doing it, but um, we always get kind of thrown out of the bus as the people that are expected to not live by science when I've, you know, I think I maybe was even taught by you that, you know, science is really something that we can look at as Christians and say, wow, like this is the DNA of God. You know, and, and, and this is, you can look into God's creation by knowing science better. Yeah. And I've always loved how you've led with that type of preaching. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, talking to somebody the other day. I, I, I was just venting. I was like, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm paying the bill of the pastors before me. Like, <laughs> sure. that, you know, they racked up all these charges by not, not, you know, by making science and God enemies, by, uh, you know, the church's relationship with politics in America. And it's like so many people that I've, had that like dislike or hate the church even it's like they describe a church that i you know did exist but i actually don't at least i i'm not that pastor or we're not that church and yet we're still kind of paying the bill of the pastors before it's not all but the many who have i think made some mistakes and and were wrong about things that um now as a new church and new generation we're trying to undo those things and present a better story um but you know yeah like science is one of them politics is one of them like i think you know, what we're seeing right now is uh, a new era, a new generation of Christians and pastors, hopefully, that are willing to say, hey, you know what, science and God aren't enemies. You know, if, if God created all the elements of science, then, uh, and we believe God's the creator behind everything, then we should be able to find God's fingerprints on science. And I think science doesn't um, deny God or uh, disprove God. I think it's just, I always have found it sort of like, it's a, uh, it's like cookie crumbs. You follow them. It's going to, you know, it, you follow the, the, the crumbs. It's going to bring you back to God. You know, at, at some point, you know, you're going to get to the bottom of it and go like, oh my gosh, there's this divine creator behind it all. Right. And so, um, yeah. And which is great because it opens up um, so many beautiful conversations that maybe in generations past, you just couldn't have, you know? Sure. Um, and, uh, and so I, th- and with politics, I think it's the same thing for, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people, they, they say, well, if you're a Christian or church, we just don't talk politics or whatever. And yeah, um, yeah. even though Jesus was like, ex- I mean, he said very political things. The early church said very political things. Uh, Jesus wasn't killed because he was a nice guy. Um, he was killed as an enemy of the state. Um, there right. were political implications to it. So 
Um, I'm excited about these conversations. They're hard because like there's, I think what we're feeling right now is this tension of like, you know, addressing something that's been there all along, but we've just sort of ignored it. And now mm -hmm. we're like going, no, we need to talk about this. We need to actually sort this out, which is yeah. fun. And I think you're so right with, you know, that statement of, you know, Jesus was a political guy in, in yeah. a sense of sometimes dismantling it, but sometimes helping us understand that, like, you also need to lean into things. Totally. And people are like, well, what would Jesus have done in this time? It's like, well, we were already would have killed him probably a thousand times over because right, right. it was preaching to a different authority. And, yeah. um, and people wanted him to be like a political leader. Oh, yeah. But, but his stance against being a definitive political leader within that structure was a political stance in itself, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when they tried to make Jesus king, uh, that was the equivalent of us today saying, let's make Jesus president. You know, that, that would have been the equivalent, and Jesus would have no part in that. Um, and Israel, if you look through the story of Israel and the Hebrew scriptures, they just continually wanted to be like all the other nations you know they asked god give us a king give us a king we want to be like all the other nations in the in the hebrew scriptures the book of first and second kings you know it's a this continual story of good kings and bad kings and they never quite get there and if you read it you kind of go like oh my gosh this is like america if you look at it. it's really every empire that you know maybe every once in a while you have a good king but then you have a bad king you have times of peace times of war and but you never quite get that stability um, and that, uh, that predictability. And that's because like at the end of the day, when you look at the story of scriptures as a whole, God's intent was never that we would just become some new empire. Uh, but he came to actually establish a kingdom, um, that was greater than any earthly empire. And that's, I think that's the tension that we're seeing in the church in America, at least is that you have what I would call very empirically minded Christians that they just want, they just want, to build another empire, you know, and they just want another king. And I think what the church now is saying is, hey, like, I think God can do better than an empire. Uh, I think God wants to do a kingdom that's um, with Jesus on the throne, you know, and, and, and so I think we're sort of asking ourselves, what does it look like to be kingdom people in an empire world? And, uh, and that is really what Jesus leaned into again and again. He invited us, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, essentially, was Jesus inviting us into a new way to be human, a new uh, a way to be a kingdom person in, in a world full of empires. And, uh, and it's very counter empire and it's beautiful, but it's really hard stuff too. Um, and mm -hmm. so that, yeah, I just don't, I don't think, you know, when people are like, hey, let's don't talk politics. I don't know how you can talk about Jesus, not seriously at least, without engaging the political conversation as well. Yeah, and I think it's okay to be confused about Jesus's political stance and spaces and your own. Mm -hmm. I, it's okay to sometimes have that rift and understand yep. there's a difference. Yep. And then, you know, lean into the Bible and lean into different pastors and lean into different, different spaces to say, what, why am I struggling with this difference? Stop yep. always saying, oh, well, obviously I'm totally connected. Like mm -hmm. start going, why do I feel different? Like, what is this weight on my heart? And you have to realize that there's a difference in order to ever get to a, a connection. Um, cause you have to realize what gap needs to close. And that's also, I think what we're struggling with a little bit politically, like with just the left and the right sometimes in these spaces. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, I, I'm finding more and more, like, we just don't do well with ambiguity. You know, we don't do well with that gray space that you have to like lean into the tension and ask tough questions. Like we just want black or white. We want this extreme or another. And I think extremism is sort of the low hanging fruit. Um, it doesn't sure. really take much thought, to be honest. Like I, literalism, extreme, extremism, and tribalism are three things that I think actually take almost no thought whatsoever. You just follow the code, obey the tribe, uh, and take the stance. And, you, and it's just sort of, you didn't really have to do any internal work to get there. Yeah. Um, and so, but I think like truth is much more in the center. Um, it's much more, I think truth is more found in the gray. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but, but it takes a whole lot more work to get there in time. Right. And, and I also think that like, there's a, there's a gap in that the understanding of what life is that God intended on earth, that mm -hmm. faith is supposed to fill that gap. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, sometimes we're given the gift of, you know, God just absolutely injecting into our heart and totally helping us understand our path and understanding our relationships. But sometimes God le leaves a little bit of room for growth 
and yeah. desire. Uh, and that can be super scary in specifically times like this, where yeah. you, you got to leave with faith a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it reminds me of how my dad taught me how to swim. And I'm not sure this is the best way to teach a kid how to swim, but it worked for me. Uh, my dad just threw me in the pool, <laughs> you know, and yeah. he stood on the side and he was there and he wasn't going to let me drown. But the way he learned me, it taught me how to swim is he threw, threw me in the pool. I felt everything going on around me, but I, I had to learn to swim. And I had to paddle. I had, and I think in a lot of ways, God, God in his goodness allows us to struggle. And I think sometimes we, we think, how is that good? How could God be good and allow us to struggle? But, um, you know, I think wisdom is developed through struggle. Strength is developed through struggle. You know, like I, I would actually argue that any wisdom you have pr came from a point of struggle in your life, you know, yeah. that you went through something, you failed, you broke down, you got hurt and you, but you made it to the other side of it. And now you're smarter and stronger as a result of it. Right. Um, and you wouldn't have gained that had you not struggled a little bit. So, you know, I think God does allow us to have these spaces of ambiguity and, you know, um, uncertainty because it does force us, to, like you said, to lean in in faith. And, um, and, and as a result, I think we get stronger. A hundred percent. Now, when we're your pastor that also is willing to lean into politics, mm -hmm. I've been a part of those communities where people don't want their pastor to lean into politics, or they're always asking you like, what is your opinion? And as if you're walking on eggshells, right? Cause like, if you say it wrong there, they might not even like show up to your church on Sunday ever yeah. again. And they might denounce you even publicly. And, but it's, I just, I look at you as a guy that has decided to lean into faith harder than most people around them and to help guide people through your understanding of the Bible that is hopefully guided best by God to give better clarity for those individuals' lives. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just a sacrifice that you made. And I, I think that sometimes people put you too much on a pedestal and they're, they're, they're waiting to either push you higher on a pedestal or like knock you off of it. How do you deal with that experience of knowing that you're just a, a person that prays to God, just like everybody else, but yeah. is just trying to lean into it for the betterment of all. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not always easy. I mean, what I have to remind people is I've been a human longer than I've been a pastor, you know, and that uh, it, I'm, I'm human to the core. I'm going to make mistakes. Um, I'm going to say things wrong. Sometimes I have said things wrong sometimes, um, you know, and, and I think it's just, Honestly, I think for me, it's understanding if you're going to lean into tough conversations, political conversations, you're not going to please everybody. Um, Jesus certainly didn't. And uh, so I shouldn't anticipate that I, everyone's going to agree with everything I have to say and that there might be some people who will walk away based on whatever stance I might take. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think it's on uh, it's it is my responsibility to ensure that I live with an open heart and open hands uh, with others as well and that I surround myself with people who think differently than I do. Um, otherwise, I, I'll just settle for the echo chamber and just look to uh, confirm my own biases. And I, I don't want to do that. So I do think it's, it's not my responsibility to control what other people think of me necessarily, but it is my responsibility to uh, position myself to stay humble and stay open, um, you know, because I'm not as right as I think, and uh, other people are not as wrong as I might think. And, yeah. uh, and so I have to, I have to really keep my heart in check. Um, you know, otherwise I will, you know, like anybody, I'll fall into that trap of pride <laughs> and, um, and people would have a good reason to walk away at that point. <laughs> Just you know? go off the rails. Yeah, totally, man. Totally. I, mean, I go off the rails every day until about 8am. <laughs> and right, then right. I try to just reconnect. I, you know, yeah. I lean on my girlfriend, I lean on, um, you know, prayer, I lean on uh, my parents, um, yeah. I lean on a smoothie or just a good jog to start getting me back to a place that I think is going to be more valuable for myself in the world. Um, yeah. So I think I struggled with that daily. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have a, you got to have a cadence to your, uh, to where you're at in life and your emotions a little bit. Like I, I think if you're angry all the time, you're just screaming all the time. Like you're, that's not a healthy position. Sometimes you need to go and just, Hey, I'm going to turn off social media. And I've done that quite often. It's like, I'm just, 
I'm cutting myself off, you know, so that I can, you know, go for the run or hang out, make sure I'm present with my wife or my child, um, you know, or do things that I just, that just fill me up. Um, I, I think that is an important lesson for all of us in this time, an election year, pandemic, the economy is going to be cra you know, crazy, all that. Like we just, we have got to pace ourselves because this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And, uh, you know, and I, I think right now, I think that's something for millennials, especially is like, you can't be angry 24 seven, you know, you've got to find a way to now channel that in different ways so that you're well-rounded and healthy. And I, th I think you're really right with that because as a sports guy, I've been in the huddle on a football field when you're on your own 10 yard line and you have 90 yards to go. The person that's always screaming, we're screwed. This isn't going to work out. We're never going to get there. Look at how bad we've been this whole game. That person's not helping us get right. through this 90 yards. You know, it does take optimism to say, we're going to get this. We're stronger than our failures in this game that we've currently had. We, mm -hmm. we can get past it. So I think sometimes my optimism comes off as thinking, well, you can light, lighten up on the gas. But my optimism is really in a place of, no, 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 Just keep your foot on the gas. This is good. But I do see too many posts every morning at 8 a.m. saying, it's time to get angry. It's time yeah. to lose our mind over this last thing Trump said. When it's like, I think it's time to act, but yeah. get angry doesn't always work. And I think it, those, those passionate rages are, there's, they're just, um, you know, even at what you kind of talk about in your, uh, death to someday podcast, which is you tell, you have a whole, um, podcast on, on that burnout, one of your, um, on the second one that you gave. And that's where I'm starting to feel some of that rage burnout. Cause you're going to have rage burnout. It's impossible yeah. to keep up that. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Uh, there's this thing called, and I'm on the front end of learning about it, but it's called spiral dynamics. And uh, it's, it's sort of like Enneagram, if you're familiar with Enneagram or disc assessments or Meyer Briggs, it's another sort of yeah. personality thing. But what's interesting about spiral dynamics is that instead of like Enneagram where they're like, you're an eight or you're a five and that's what you are sort of thing, this is color coded and each of these colors represent a different emotion and, and you tend to lean more towards one. But the goal is that you would actually represent all the colors and find a good pace. So like red means anger. And anger can be really helpful, but what they're saying is like, if you're angry all the time, it always, it always falls apart. And like, um, so like blue is like your strategic and your, uh, a little bit more practical, you're, you're taking action. Steps. Sounding pretty political here. <laughs> I know, right? And, uh, and like they gave the good example of Martin Luther King Jr. That, um, that he was, he knew how to fluctuate between red and blue. So at one point he would be red and he would tell the president, we're walking across Selma and everyone's going to see your police uh, beating the tar out of us. It's going to be broadcast for everyone to see. Like that was red. That was full fledged red right there. Right. But then he would get, uh, uh, and this, uh, you know, they say, you know, spiritual leaders tend to be more blue, that they tend to be more like the systems and uh, practical steps and everything. He would swing between red and blue frequently he would cross the bridge in anger, but then he would strategize afterwards. And it was his ability to really fluctuate that gave him his um, effectiveness and strength. Uh, I think you look at any, I mean, I don't know who your viewers are, but let's just say Trump, right? Yep. Trump, Trump tends to be red almost all the time, right? All the time, yeah. All the time. And it's <laughs> exhausting. And it's, yeah. And after a while now, I think we're starting to go, that's not working well. Like we need a new color now. Like we need, we need something else here because fear all the time just doesn't work. Anger all well, the time doesn't work. And I think, I think what Trump's done well in his space that he's trying to go with mm -hmm. is I think he's a troll and, and everything that he tweets, I don't believe that he, I don't think he holds the rage that he places in his dialect and his, mm -hmm. in, in his rhetoric. I mean, mm -hmm. um, because he has such a motor, right? Like he has such high energy for so long. He's willing to say the craziest thing that he knows is going to make the left go crazy on all the time. There's yeah. no way he can actually hold that energy, internalize it all day. 
But I think he, he uses it to his advantage to say, I know that these words are harmful and I know that these words are going to hurt. And so he uses it to wear out his enemy. The same way that on a basketball court, you're like, you're dribbling. You don't, you don't think that the person's bad at playing. You just go, man, you really are playing bad today. Right. Oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're not going to win this game, huh? And totally. so you're using that energy to your advantage. I think that I see him use that as a strategy where, so to take everything that he says to its complete belief is, um, is almost playing into his hands sometimes. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you're, you're right on that. His strat, he knows good news or bad news is still news. And it's, you know, in our media driven world, he who makes the loudest noise wins, you know, and he knows how to make noise. He knows how to be loud. And, uh, um, and it, it has, I mean, riled up his base and, uh, and, and he got elected. Right. So like, I, I don't think we can argue that the strategy didn't work necessarily, but it's kind of like going back to what we, you know, even talked about is what's helpful. You know, like, mm -hmm. so even going like, hey, like you can post an angry Instagram or story or tweet like every hour on the hour and maybe you're right, but is it helpful? You know, right. like, and I think not, not every, you know, it's, um, it's like when you're married, right? Like in any healthy marriage, and I'm still learning this one, you can say the right thing, but you say it the wrong, at the wrong, the wrong way or at the wrong time, it's unhelpful. It's as bad as saying the wrong thing. There's been plenty of times I've said the right thing. I was right, but it was the wrong way or wrong time to say it to Jetta. And therefore it didn't work out. It was as yeah. bad as saying the wrong thing. So I, I think there is a strategy that needs, especially for people who are serious about, hey, look, I want to I want to make a long-term impact and be a part of, as I said earlier, like leaving the world better than how we found it. Um, okay, well, there's going to be some strategy to that. And, and I think that's where some of us, before we tweet or post or you know, share, we ask, hey, is this right and is it helpful? And if you can find a way to do both, that's, that's, that's the spot to be in, I think. I, I agree 100%. So, you know, we've, we've really gotten to a place in the United States where racial inequity is uh, finally on the forefront again, right? And um, it's, it, it's happened throughout seasons of this country, um, but this is in a place where I feel like maybe we can break through. And you've done a really good job leading through that. What's, what's your mentality, you know, as being a, a white guy who's leading a community, um, where do you place yourself in this space of leading through racial inequity and the, the conversations and when you need to step back to, to let other people step forward. Um, what's, what's your mindset? Where are you educating yourself? And, and what would you help other people to understand of how we can do it better? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm really passionate about this and it's not because I've got it nailed. Um, I am, I think the first thing I had to learn as a white guy is, is I have been a part of the problem, you know, like that uh, maybe I have not been out blatantly racist um, or anything like that, but um, my silence, my apathy, um, I've, I've benefited from a system in America that was built for, for white people in, in particular, white men. Uh, yeah. And, and I've benefited it from it every day of my life. And if I'm not deconstructing that system, then I am perpetuating it. And I'll say it's only been until probably the last couple of years that I've realized, you know what, I can't just like not be racist. I need to be anti-racist. I need to cross that line and actually deconstruct the very system that has benefited me at the expense of people of color um, and, and especially female uh, people of color. Uh, that that um, the system has been rigged against, and that uh, decentralizing whiteness, you know, is is a hard conversation. Conversation. Uh, it's it's. I wish I could be like, yeah, I've totally. It's like a light switch for me. I get it. Like, no, I've still still got a lot more work to do. And so I think as I've leaned into it, I've just had to do so with like this awareness that um, I have so much to learn, and uh, to to be a better student than I am teacher. Like, I don't feel really, I have a whole lot of right to teach on this, um, but, um, but I, I want to be a good student and learn from our history, 
um, learn from my uh, peers, my friends uh, who are not white and learn from their experiences and make sure that my circle is, is I extremely diverse. Um, you know, cause I, I meet a lot of people, especially pastors, I'll, I'll meet pastors like, yeah, we're all about like diversity at our church. We're like, we're all about it. And I'll be like, okay, show me your board. And I'll look at their board and they're all white men. Right. I'm like, so you're not really about diversity. And I just think on a personal level, well, on, a, on an organizational level, uh, if, if you don't have, if you are not giving power away to people of color, then you're really not about equity. You might say you are, but you're really not. And I think in the same way, and personally, I need to have people that I've now given access to my life to challenge me, to confront me, um, and to deconstruct my own whiteness. Uh, you know, I have to give that power away to people of color in my life. And I have a few friends that are, you know, I've given that to that have been so, so helpful. And so right. um, I, I think that's where I'm at really is just continuing, continuing to deconstruct, um, you know, the system I benefited from to identify as Ibram Kendi, if you haven't read how to be an anti-racist, um, or I, I, I've read a little bit of it just, just through the first few chapters there. Um, he okay. sets up, I think a premise that's very approachable. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit, it's quite a bit different actually than white fragility. Um, which are, is another book I think that also viewers should read. And I've, I've read more of that one, um, yeah. than how to be the anti-racist, but yeah, your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, the big idea Ibram Kendi really teaches on that I think is, was game, a game changer for me is that we tend to focus all on racist action. And so we try and eliminate racist actions. So he says, but you can uh, try and eliminate racist action and not eliminate racism because at the end of the day, you need to eliminate the racist ideas that lead to the racist action. And so for me, it's not been going, hey, maybe I'm not like this outward racist, but do I hold any ideas that actually are racist? You know, I, and, and that has been a journey of going, what are those little ideas that cause me to, you know, uh, put my phone away, you know, when I'm on the Muni, when, uh, you know, a, a black man enters the bus and I, I just put my phone, why, why did I do that? But when a white guy comes on, I, I just, you know, keep talking on it. I don't even think twice right. about it. Like, what is the idea? And this is a very small example, but what's the idea humming underneath the surface of that? And that's sort of where I've been challenging people, um, you know, especially my white friends and um, especially boomer generation white people that I've talked to as I'm, you know, is going, hey, can we just talk about like the idea underneath what you just said? And let's talk through that. Um, and what... I'm finding is, you know, a lot of us actually, especially white men in particular hold, well, and white women hold racist ideas that we have to identify and then get rid of. Right. Yeah. Because um, I think we, we all grow up in different societies. Like I lived in a bubble. Like I grew up in a parent, a, a household where my parents were, they loved each other. And they, I, I grew up in a, a place where I was economically stable. Uh, in a community that um, didn't, I didn't see the struggle of race in it. Um, and so you almost think that that has to do with every element of the world, right? And mm. it could have been happening right in front of my eyes. I just wasn't aware of it. And yeah. it's okay that I grew up and I wasn't aware of it. That's yeah. okay. Right. But now I need to be able to lean into the aspect of, but this is happening. And now that I'm aware of it, it's not okay for me to allow it to happen anymore. And, I, and everybody grew up in their own racial bubble. And so we have to realize that we all had different understandings of what life was until like the age of 12. Right. And then when you start waking up and you become 16 and 18, you start to develop a little bit more mental awareness. And I don't think all of that understanding really absorbs until you're like 25. And so we're all now breaking into the space of trying to develop more clarity. And we have to be willing to realize that we were all just kids at one point, every yeah. single person in the world. Yeah. And so, and that's to just, and your parents were just kids too. Yeah, right. So it's okay to realize that you're wrong in some aspects of your life. Like it's all, it's all right. Absolutely. I mean, you are not, you're not getting wiser if you if you do not realize that you're not that you're wrong in some areas you know i think it was muhammad ali said something like if i think the same way in 20 years from now that i did uh, if i'm thinking the same way 20 years from now then i just wasted the last 20 years of my life 
you know, and I think that's, that's huge. It's true. Like I hope in 20 years, I look back on myself and go, Oh, what, what was I thinking? Like, you know, what, why did I do that? Why was I, you know, uh, living with those ideas? That, that's a good thing. That means I'm growing, you know, it means yeah. I'm maturing. And so, you know, and I think like when it comes to racism, I, I, I strongly believe that racists are not born. There is no baby who's a racist baby, <laughs> you know, like right. racists, racists are not born. Racists are made um that racism is passed down from generation to generation uh you look at the two men who murdered Ahmad Arbery it was a father and a son it was this sort of like sobering picture of generational race the baton being passed down from father to son mm -hmm. the son was only doing what he was he was only using what he was given and right. I think it's realizing not only with racism but that's certainly a big one but we are all handed something as children that you take because you're a child. And later on in life, you realize, ooh, I was, I was given this. And it's now for me to like evolve into a better human being. I now need to leave that behind. I now need to recognize what was put in my hands and I need to leave that behind. Like I remember uh, my first encounter with racism when I was a little boy, so young, I don't even remember. I just remember my grandpa sitting me down and saying, Travis, if you ever married somebody who's not white, you will be kicked out of this family. And, and I remember like carrying that for years of my life until eventually I realized I was like, you know what? Um, that was wrong. That was racism. And I now need to like drop that, acknowledge it and then leave it behind and move forward and learn from it. So, you know, I think that's a question we can all, you know, wrestle with is like the convictions we have um, I don't think any conviction a person has is made in isolation. You didn't just wake up and go, now that's my conviction from politics to uh, anthropology to anything like economics. There's no conviction you have that you just woke up with. It was handed down to you probably by a well-intentioned person that was trying to protect you from what they believe to be a dangerous world. And some of those convictions are wrong. And, and you've got to actually go, hey, this, this, was, this is a broken conviction and I now need to leave it behind. 100%. So I love yeah, it. I think with racism, man, it's, just, yeah. it's, it's such a huge topic. And, you know, I think I, what I would encourage white people is um, don't treat your black friends like your human Google. You know, they're not here to be your therapist. They're not here to be your uh, personal Google assistant. Uh, you know, do your homework. And if you have a couple close, you know, friends who are, um, you know, not white, you know, ask them, Hey, would you be willing if I ever have questions to bring them to you? But I've made the mistake and I see it a lot right now where white people are going to all their, you know, black friends and saying, Hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? And that's, you're almost forcing them to relive the trauma of racism by doing that. Um, and so it's like, you need to do your work and then, you know, any questions you might have afterwards, maybe bring those but only to those that have given you that sort of access. I think <laughs> it is good. weird when people are trying to like form friendships to be like, you're going to be my racist reliability partner. It's, it's crazy, like, right? No, like let's have a friendship because we want to be friends. Yes. And that can't be the foundation of any friendships. And, yep. and if, 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 if you're a white person who doesn't have any friends of color, you're going to have to start with a different jump point than that. That's yeah. not going to work. Yeah. Like, go, yeah. Go into your like, you know, friend and person of color and doing what you're saying and be like, Hey, I need you to be my like personal tutor here on <laughs> history of racism in America. That is like me robbing your house, LJ, and then feeling bad about it later. I took all your furniture and everything. I felt bad. And then I go back to you and go, Hey man, can you go to Ikea with me and buy new furniture for your house? And can you help me put it back together for you? Like, you'd be like, no, dude, you, you rob the house, you <laughs> yeah. buy the furniture and put it together, you know? And so I think a lot of white people like, white people have been robbing the house of uh, black men and women for 400 plus years. And some of us have the audacity to go back to them and say, Hey, sorry, we robbed your house. Can you help us rebuild it now? Like, no, they don't owe us that. Um, I, we, we need to do our work um, as white people to deconstruct the system we built and have benefited from uh, to learn about it and learn from it. And, uh, you know, I think reconciliation is sort of a, a tricky 
racial reconciliation is this big topic we all want to talk about. The issue with re reconciliation, and I could be wrong in this, this is just my opinion. Reconciliation sort of presupposes that both sides were wrong and both sides kind of owe it to each other to meet up and everything. Okay. I think, I think the problem with that is like the black community doesn't owe us a conversation. Like they don't owe us that. Like we are the ones who are in the wrong in this. Right. Um, and so I think like we as white people have to be okay that if there are friends who aren't white who are going like, hey, I'm sorry, like I just cannot, I'm just not there yet. Yeah. Like be okay with that. Be okay with that. They don't owe right. you. Right. So because yeah. because a lot of people give racist friends the pass of oh you're just not there yet mm. right as far as like the uh, your white friend that's a little bit racist mm -hmm. lean more on them as helping them making sure that they are not having those beliefs before you go to a disgruntled black individual who's not ready to empathize with your now recent empathy yeah. you know it's yeah. like come on like let's let's we got to figure out where be more bothered by the confederate flag before you're yeah. bothered by a, a person of color who's not ready to to get to the space of we're we're just buddy buddy yet um, yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. um i i love where you're leading with those conversations and i see you do it constantly so i, I do thank you for that um in, in a city that has a lot of space to grow within yeah. within that conversation i think san francisco is is an interesting um space uh oh, yeah. for that Mm -hmm. So you have a podcast that you've recently launched called death to someday. Mm -hmm. And, um, I guess it's not just a podcast. It, it's, it's, it's really a service that you're offering to people to be, uh, is it, is it a career coach or a mentor? What, what is your thought processes while you are starting these conversations about like, let's start, if you have something on your heart that you want to be able to give a product or service to the world, it's time to start today. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of refer to myself as a courage coach, you know, that I, okay. I, I really like helping people who are at that tipping point of they're, they're, they're making this decision, like, am I going to do the nine to five? Am I going to make a living? Or am I going to um, actually pursue that passion, that dream that I have and go and make a life? Because I think the two are different. You can make a living, but not make a life. And there's a lot of people who've settled for making a living um, when they were created to make a life and a life, right. making a life is bigger than a paycheck. It's living with purpose, you know? And so death to someday really is for anybody who's at that, at that turning point that just needs a little jolt of courage. And I want to come alongside them, challenge them, encourage them and, uh, give them the nudge they need to now take that step, uh, into, uh, what it means to make a life. And so that's what the podcast is for. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of beginning right now, but eventually what I'd love to do is do uh, individual and group coaching uh, to help uh, just, yeah, help people take that step. Because for me, like nothing brings me more joy in my life than seeing somebody, uh, you know, take the risk and uh, take their passion and turn it into a reality. And uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love you, man. Like, I, I feel like I, I was always drawn to you because you were doing that and are doing that. Yeah. And, uh, and I respect that so much about you. And I just, I want to see others do that. Cause I, I can't tell you as a pastor, how many people I've met near the end of their life. And it's just so full of regret. So, and it's not about, man, I wish I made more money. I've never heard anybody say that like, Oh man, I would just wish I made more money. It was always like, I wish I did that. I wish I would have mm -hmm. just taking the risk um and so I and it's usually that's... like pretty small risk really at the end of the day it's it's yeah. just opening your heart up to telling your friend hey do you know what i really want to be a designer yeah right. and I, I i actually think that i have a little bit different of a perspective than a lot of the designers that i currently see on yeah. my instagram or in the world yeah. and that that initial step to just even telling your closest five people whether it's your wife your dad your brother and your two closest friends say, I think I might like this. That, that's the scariest step in starting anything is telling yep. your core. Cause yep. then that means you actually have to tell yourself and now you have the accountability to, to sit around and start drawing um, yep. and designing. Yeah, hundred percent, man. I mean, you will never accomplish any of the goals you don't talk about. You know, I just, if you don't talk about a goal, if you don't say it, there's something powerful, spiritual, mystical, whatever you want to word you want to use about just saying out loud what it is you want to do. 
and saying it to somebody else. It, it does, like you said, create, it creates this accountability. I think it creates a level of urgency and it does feel like this scary thing, but you know, I would compare it to like a scarecrow, you know, that scarecrows are meant to intimidate the birds. But if the birds would just realize whenever they saw a scarecrow, that meant the good stuff was like just behind it. It was just on the other side of it. And although yeah. it might look scary, it, it can't even touch you. You know, I think that's for a lot of us, these fears we have are, you know, the equivalent of scarecrows that, and we should almost like, I want to get people to the point where they realize every time they feel that fear, it's a, it's a sign that there's some good stuff behind it. So you just got to keep moving forward. Right. And I mean, that's what this, this thing is for me. I tell all my friends, Hey, this is just a hobby. Um, this is something that I'm just playing around with during COVID. But my expectation really is if in 10 years that this could be something that um, can create a some level of lifestyle for me. I want this yeah. to be incorporated in a space that allows me to have some monetary value, but more of a value of actually being a part of more cultural conversations. I love being able to sit here and dialogue with you as a pastor in San Francisco, seeing the change that you create and giving you space to just talk. Um, yeah. And I don't think we have enough places where I think that that dialogue is happening. So I think it's okay sometimes to say, hey, like, just, you know, I'm going to start this hobby. Like, I'm just going to play around in this place. Don't, don't take me too seriously with it. I'm not a professional at it. I'm just, yeah. just give me time with this. But this is something that I'm really interested in. And invite some people in with you. And I've seen those things grow into to reality. We, we had this company that we started when we were in San Francisco. It, it took us there, it took me to LA. And then I recently got kicked out of it, you know? And so now I get to sit back in the sandbox and start playing again. Yeah. Um, and it's scary when you, you built something that you felt like was going to be your journey forever, or maybe just for a while. I never really thought of it as a forever journey. Um, but then um, you turn around, you're like, all right, I need, I need to start something new. I need to dust myself off and, and, and start a new trajectory. So I, I, I love it how you're just encouraging people to, to start walking through that space and not be so fearful of playing in the mud with things that you believe on your heart that maybe God's placing there to say like, this could be your truest journey. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's, I don't know, you know, it's that old cliche, you only got one life to live, but it's like you do, you know, and, yeah. and so like, let's, what does it look like for you to truly like live that life and not just exist through it um, and not just survive through it? Um, what does it look like to actually live? And I, I think it's, it's easier said than done because there might be somebody listening like, oh, I don't know, I have all these thoughts. It's just so complicated. And I just really think you got to find this intersection of what do you love? What are you good at? And what does the world need? And if you can find an answer to those three questions, the intersection of those three questions, what do you love? What are you good at? And what does the world need? Um, then, then that's, that's the sweet spot. That's calling. If you want to use that word, that's purpose. Right. Um, and I think about you, you know, what do you love? You love having deep, meaningful conversations. I knew that from being in your small group with you. And, um, what are you good at? You're really good at actually facilitating, uh, two way conversations. Uh, not everyone's that good at that, but you are, you're really good at creating a safe space for people to open up and what does the world need? I mean, you said it, they really need a place where they can do those sort of things. And so I think right now this, just to encourage you, man, this, this uh, podcast that you know, right here is, is, is those, you answering those three questions. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be really meaningful. Well, I appreciate that. And you know, anybody who's looking to have Travis as like your potential mentor and to come into this uh, death to somebody, just explain your story of starting Canvas. Like you have taken the leap. So if, if to, I, I can look at you as you're an ultimate entrepreneur to me. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, you've taken sometimes the, the biggest risk in life, which is to be a pastor is like the scariest risk of all. Um, talk about how, how that became to be a, a, to where you even are now. Um, it's incredible how you got to San Francisco to me. Yeah, you know, I mean, a, a long time. So my wife and I, we've been married, it'll be 15 years in May. So you know, we were, I was 19, she was 20. And we knew early on, like we wanted to be pastors. We wanted to be pastors in a place where there weren't a lot of churches. Cause I wasn't born and raised in the church. I remember walking into a church and not getting all the language, not knowing all the inside jokes and, and honestly not even liking it that much. Um, so I remember being that person. And once I, 
you know, started following Jesus and decided, you know, I, I want to be a pastor. I decided I want to create a church where people who were like me, who didn't know the, the lingo or the, the right answers, you know, or even really like church that much could come in and feel safe, feel seen and feel heard. And, uh, and so we knew we weren't going to go to the Bible belt. We knew we needed to be somewhere where, uh, uh, there just weren't a lot of churches. And that naturally led us to, uh, wanting to start a church in San Francisco. Um, and I've always been entrepreneurial. I've always liked building something from nothing. And, uh, you know, I just began to apply a lot of my past experiences from, uh, you know, I recorded my own, I used to do rap music. So I recorded my own album, went on a tour. Used to, I did like a pop-up clothing thing out of my minivan in high school. Like I, I just took all these like experiences I had of starting things and applied that uh, to this venture of starting a church in, in a city uh, like San Francisco. And uh, I mean, it, it took time. It took time. It took, and it, but it, it took me progressively, like just saying, I'm going to take one step at a time. I'm going to learn as much as I can. Um, and I'm going to take a whole lot of risks. And, um, you know, the, the craziest part is we decided we were going to move out to San Francisco, had no idea how we were going to afford it. Um, at this point, it was more expensive than New York uh, to live in. And, and yet we we're going to go start a nonprofit. You know, it doesn't make, it doesn't add up. It doesn't no. make sense on paper. Um, and San Francisco is known as a graveyard for churches. Most churches last, you know, that start from scratch, usually about 18 months and then they close their doors. And wow. so the odds were against us, but we really felt like this is what it looks like to make a living, to start a church for people who maybe, uh, you know, like Jesus, but don't really like the church can be, uh, feel safe, seen and heard. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we, we made this decision, we're going to go. And I remember one night. Uh, I was just praying. I was just like, God, if there's a way where I don't have to work a nine to five while trying to do this startup church, uh, I, you know, show me how that looks like. I'll do it, but I prefer not. And uh, we had already set a date. We knew we were going to move. So it, it was just like we were committed, but prayed that prayer. The very next morning, I had a text message from another pastor who had heard me at a conference speak and he said he wanted to talk to me. Long story short, we talked for a few hours and he said, you know, is there, what could I do to help you get out here to San Francisco? And I, I just, as an entrepreneur, I think you're, you're wired to shoot for the stars, right? right? So I was like, well, you can just, you can pay my salary and help until we get self-sustainable. And, and he said, yeah, I think we could do that. You know, and, um, you know, less than 24 hours later, it's just this answer to prayer. And that's just, that's not how it works for everybody. That certainly hasn't always worked that way for me, but that time sure. it did. And, um, and so we took this leap and, you know, I think what I learned from that, that can apply to whether you're a Christian or not listening to this is that I really am a big believer that if you follow purpose, uh, provision will follow, you know, and, and a lot of uh, the time we want provision to follow and then we'll follow purpose. Uh, but for us, um, we made the decision. We're going to move. We, we quit our jobs. Like this was happening. So we follow purpose first. And then provision followed that. And so for anybody who's like on that tipping point right now, and they're like, man, should I do this? I just want to encourage you. I actually think if you follow purpose, the, it's amazing how resources fall into place and the right, right people will come. And, um, but you have to take that step of that courageous step as a, uh, how to build a zoo. I don't know if you saw that movie or how to buy a zoo. I can't remember. The oh Matthew yeah. Movie. Yeah. Well, is, um, it, is it Brad Pitt or somebody like that? Or maybe Mark Wahlberg? Yeah. Yeah. And there's this one line, he's like, you just need 20 sec seconds of insane courage. And That's I think right. for any entrepreneur, you need that. You need those, like, you just need those 20 seconds of insane courage to, to say, hey, I'm, we're going to do this and provision will follow. And so we came out, we had a team of 23 people move from Arizona to San Francisco. And that was just a lot of us asking that, you know, we weren't paying them or anything. It was just like, would you take this risk with us? And we just decided we weren't going to say no for anybody. We were going to make them tell us no. And they ended up saying a lot more said yes than we thought. And uh, again, I think that applies whether you're starting a church or a, you know, a tech company is that, you know, like don't write people off. Don't, don't settle for plan B, you know, shoot for plan A. You just never know how it'll work out. Cause I think passion is contagious that when you're really, 100%. really passionate, you will draw other passionate people around you. Um, and, uh, and you'll be able to see that passion become a reality. So well, and what was so, go ahead. So, well, what was so cool with your story too is, you know, you probably had it in your heart. You're probably, you know, sleeping at night. You're, you're talking to Jenna about it. 
and you're like, well, will anybody even believe me that like, I'm going to be like the lead pastor of a church, right? Like, is that, <laughs> would anybody even like think that that's, that's possible in me? Do they see that in me? Yeah. You had several friends say, not only they believe in you, that they're with you in this church. Yeah. Yeah. Your church followed you to that space with multiple people giving up their jobs who, yeah. who weren't associated with the church other than just members saying, cool, we'll, we'll plant this church with you there. And, and we'll go and be a part of the San Francisco community and having tech jobs and having lawyer jobs, but are still saying, but we're going to come to your church every single Sunday and, and walk through the phase of growth yeah. with you. Yeah. Super humbling. I mean, it, it never, every time I think about how we started and everyone who came, like it is, it's incredibly humbling. Um, Cause I was at that point, I was 24. Like, I mean, what did I know? Like I was he's so young and, and yet they decided to take the risk and, you know, I, yeah, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful for them. And, and I just think like, you know, if you, I don't know, if you build deep community and solid community, like those people are going to support you. And, you know, I just think for anyone that wants to take a, start a new business or anything, like get some really good people around you that champion you. They don't just tell you what you want to hear. Like that's not good community, but people who really are for you, believe in you and are willing to tell you the hard stuff. Um, and you'll be better as a result, you know, cause you, you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't like, we could have raised all the money we needed, but if I didn't have those 23 people, this church doesn't happen. So I just think we're 100%. better with people. And I, I mean, I, I just experienced that so much while I was out there and, you know, well, I was able to have my girlfriend come out there and, you know, we were able to see that city together, um, bring her there for the first time, um, since we'd been, you know, in a relationship. Yeah, yeah, you want to see the Golden Gate Bridge, you want to see the Palace of Fine Arts, sure, but I wanted to show her the community of Canvas because you all have created a space of just incredible people and incredible conversations and incredible expectations for what it can be like to be a community that has um, greater aspirations for humanity. So it's it's so beautiful out there. Mm, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate it. I wish... I mean, I'm glad you're doing well, but we sure miss you here in San Francisco. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, and I do empathize for you. San Francisco is a revolving door like all big cities. And I, I, I see so many passerbys who are just glue in your community, like yeah. walking yeah. through. But, but San Francisco is a difficult city to live in. And, but you, you could continue to be this weed that won't get uh, blown off of something that feels like yeah. a desert sometimes for faith communities. Yeah, especially right now with COVID, man. I mean, it's just, there's an exodus. I don't know if it's the same where you're at, but just- LA is the same thing. I have lost majority of my friends here. Yeah. yeah, same here, man. It's brutal. It's brutal. Like, I think that's been the hardest part for me personally through COVID. It's just the, like every week, somebody's like, hey, can we talk? And you know, you know what that conversation is going to be, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so yeah, that's the nature of cities like- LA, San Francisco, New York, it's just, it feels like a parade almost that they're here and you're like, Hey, and then they're, then they're gone, you know, and it, it never, I don't think it ever gets easier, but I guess that just means you're loving well. Like yeah. if, it, if it gets easy, it means I've probably not done community right. So and I could tell you that although they leave the presence of being inside that church and in that seat every single Sunday, they're, they're taking your message with them in every city mm -hmm. canvas is growing in each mm -hmm. space that those people move to so you know well you talk about you know planting churches in different environments you can know that when a friend moves to seattle or portland or new york or that's your church yeah. actually planting itself in a new space it's it's yeah. it's 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 wearing your the, your thoughts and your um beliefs in jesus on its sleeve everywhere it goes so um mm -hmm. It's, it's more planted than, um, you know, it is in calls to prayer that might happen when you feel like it always needs to have a flag to attached to it. That's, it's just yeah. not true. Oh, that's cool, man. That, that's encouraging. I appreciate that. So, it, you know, being Christians and, and being aware of culture, I hope I, I haven't invaded too much of your time yet, right? No, man, you, this is great. I love you're it. You're still all right. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to get you off of this uh, conversation without discussing Kanye. Because... This Discussing just saying, just Kanye. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I personally think that Kanye would almost be a chapter of the Bible if we were to continue to write it. Right. Um, because he, it, 
I see a person who has inspired me in so many ways. Mm -hmm. He's inspired me of how to take that uh, emotion of, hey, I think I can do this and take it to the highest level and watch that, you know, desire as a young person to have some level of creativity and watch it be observed by other people and say, you got it. You're amazing. But then also falling under the space of letting your ego get too much in the way of being that beautiful creator that God probably intended him to be. Mm -hmm. So what, what can Christians learn from a guy like Kanye? Uh, Where, what are your, what is your thought process towards an individual like him? Um, Yeah. I I just, I've been, haven't been able to have that conversation with you since a lot of these different things have happened. Um, Yeah. Yeah, What's your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, honest, I, I hope his encounter with God, is genuine. I, and I actually believe like something is happening in Kanye's life that has shifted something very dramatically in him. Uh, because if, if you're talking about him trying to like gain, I mean, I guess he's gaining publicity and whatever, but I don't know if he's gaining a following. I actually think he's losing a following with a lot of oh, what, what he's recently doing. his following is falling off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just going, I'm talking about like his, his like graduation album and things like that. Like that felt awesome. And I also really liked his last religious album. I felt like that, that reflected, well, I've never heard that music inside churches before. I had a church conference the weekend that it launched or uh, he released it. And I was like, he brought a new life to church that I haven't been able to experience before. And now yeah. everything else kind of happens, but I see myself in him sometimes where yeah. I, I have that back and forth of being a great person and having some shitty thoughts too. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a great way of putting it. Like is remembering that uh, in a lot of ways, we're all Kanye, you know, that we uh, encounter, especially I'll say to myself, like encounter God. And it's not like, Oh, no, now I'm a perfect person. I say things all the right way. I'm not selfish. I'm not materialist. No, that's not how it works. Like I'm still very much a work in progress. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, like what makes the good news good is grace, not works, not perfection, but grace It's that God loves us. Not because of what we, uh, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus did, you know? And so, Grace is really easy to receive. Um, it's really hard to extend to somebody else, especially somebody that you disagree with or says things that like really hit, hit some buttons for you. Right. Or even it's just blatantly wrong. I mean, Kanye has said some things that you're going, that's just actually wrong. You know, like that's, that's not okay. Um, right. But I think where the church, you know, this cancel culture thing is sort of interesting, you know, because I, I wonder where grace fits in in cancel culture. Like, how does that work? You know, where it's so easy right now or somebody to basically measure somebody by one bad moment. And I think that's that's sort of what cancel culture does. Um, whereas like grace says, I see all your bad moments, but I see the human underneath all of that. And that's a human that God loves. And I I, I don't know. I think as the church, I'll speak to Christians, like we need to err towards grace. And there's certainly times where I think we need to, if you want to say cancel something, you know, like maybe it's toxic or abusive or unhappy, like maybe you do need to create some space or whatever. But at the same time, I think we've got to err towards grace. Um, and, uh, and, and that's hard. Grace is messy. Grace is really messy. It's not linear. Um, and, and, and so I think with Kanye is a great example of um, we're all works in progress. We need to extend them crazy amount of grace. Um, I think it is a good example of when somebody in scripture backs us up, right? Of like, you know, as far as elders in the church, uh, you know, Paul writes, he says, like, don't let somebody who's new to faith, like quickly become an elder because like, they're not ready for that. They're not right. ready for that role of leadership and, uh, and they're going to fall. And I almost wonder if Kanye is a good example of that, that he had this encounter with God, changed his heart, changed his life. But then he went from like new follower of Jesus to I'm going to be the president, like a presidential candidate politically that arena, but also like in the church, we like rushed him to the spotlight. Like we gave him no space to just grow and and soak in this relationship with Jesus. We're just like, and I think it's Christian pop culture. We, 
we're always looking for the next rock star to represent Christianity. And I think it's, it's him and know, Justin Bieber and like, you know, we're just like, these are our, our pinnacles of faith. And this is how, this is how yep. God makes you shine. And yep. in some ways I actually think God shines through me and you and them yep. in different ways. Right. Um, but man, we have to stop idolizing people. We, we have do. to start looking at everyone as just a human with mm-hmm. specific characteristics that are God given that are going to highlight his message in the right way if they're taking on that space for it to, to breathe through them. Yep. But that doesn't mean that you're perfect and stop trying to make people perfect. And when you think you're perfect, spiritual warfare is going to rip you apart. Yeah. Hundred percent, man. I mean, I think it goes back to that conversation of like the church is always looking for its next king or queen. You know, we want to be like the rest of the world, and Israel did it. We do it. We not only do it politically, we do it with pop culture. Uh, that pop culture is is I think one of the main major idols of of America, and we're yeah. like, well, we need to be like them. So we need we need our own Bieber. You know, we need our <laughs> own Kanye and. Um, as a result, it, it sets, I think it really set, I mean, I think we saw it with Justin Bieber and we see it with Kanye that it sets them up to fail. Um, I mean, I think we fail to realize like Paul, when he was Saul, right, he has this, this encounter with God on a road called Damascus. I mean, before he became Paul, he was Saul, he was murdering Christians. He was as bad as you can get. And then he encounters God and then he goes on to plant churches. And the issue is though, we turn a few pages and we see Saul become Paul planting churches. And we don't realize there was like 15 years between Damascus and Paul planting his first church. I mean, and where he actually went into not hiding, I guess, but he was very much under the radar and he was underneath a rabbi, uh, many assume Gamaliel for 15 years before starting a church. Um, And I think we forget that because in our Bible, we just turn a couple pages. And so I think what I'm trying to say is I think we get a guy like Kanye who has an encounter with God and we're like, all right, be our spokesperson to the top. Yeah. And he's not, I mean, he's not ready for it. And I feel for, that's where I feel bad for him. Cause we you know? actually, in a weird way, we put that fuel in his tank, totally. right? Like, cause yeah. we all would take on if, if, we would all take on God's calling, right? Yeah. Like when we feel called, like, Hey, I feel like I have, I'm getting a feeling that I have a vision that God has for the world. And I can maybe try to speak that clarity into life. Yeah. And then everyone says, dude, you got it. Yeah. You go, okay, I got it. Send me up. Yeah. And, but our egos just get so crumbly in those spaces. And, uh, yeah. I also, I I believe in the devil. I I, I believe in, I believe in heaven and I believe in hell. Um, And I think that the, the more that you encounter a a deeper relationship with God, I also see the darker elements of um, negative and negative energy also encounter your life almost in equal forces. And that's like, that's so difficult. Like I, that's why I empathize with those leaders in those spaces to go, Ooh, I wouldn't want to take that on yet. Cause I'm not strong enough for that type of spiritual warfare. Right. That seems scary to me. I hope to be able to, to be present and to, to deny that negative energy one day. I want to, to be able to lead in those types of spaces, yep. but I, I wouldn't want that energy now. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, look at the disciples. They were, they literally walked with Jesus, did, saw miracles done by Jesus for three years. And they were, they still ran away when Jesus was arrested. And that was three years walking with Jesus in the flesh. And yet for people like Kanye, you encounter God and we're like in three minutes, we're like, all right, you know, go put out an album, you know, talking about your faith. And I just think it's, it's like, you, they're not ready they make it, I think they're an easy target if we're going to talk spiritual warfare for the, for the devil. I mean, just easy, like, because like God had not, there had not been enough time for the Holy Spirit to even like begin to sanctify some of the things like pride and materialism and all those things that take a person down. Um, you know, and I just, I, I, I know there was a pastor that was in the, and I don't know the guy and I'm sure he's great, but like, I wonder if he had conversations with Kanye saying, Hey man, I know like you want to put out this album like right now, but I think you need to wait. 
I think you just need to be mm -hmm. still. I think, you know, and I wonder who's in his corner saying, um, we have to think long. We have to think the long, uh, you know, more the long game. And um, I don't, it doesn't seem like there's, if he, if he has those people, he absolutely is not listening to them. Um, but I, I or those people are just saying yes to him yeah. with, all, with all those things. And they're looking at him as a leader and, and I can look at you as a leader, but I can still like, I don't have to agree with everything you say. And, and I think when we're like, when we're brothers in Christ too, it's important to um, help each other be aware of different perspective and yeah. say, Oh, well, if you're going to say Harriet Tubman is <laughs> who she was with the way that Kadia was saying that she was selling uh, slaves to white people up yeah. North, that's just wrong. Like, yeah, and, right. and those are those types of things where you, we don't want cancel culture, but right. like that's going to press pause at any level of leadership for a while. Oh, you absolutely. Know? There's going to be, I mean, there's going to be a recovery now period that if anyone's going to take Kanye seriously, um, it's going to take some time now uh, after, after statements like that, you know, and not only that, but I mean, he's, he's talked openly, his family's talked openly um, or his wife's talked openly about his mental illness. And like, so you're talking a lot of things at play right now that, I mean, this, this guy's walking and working through. Um, I mean, it's hard enough to start to follow Jesus when you're pretty balanced mentally, but like, if you are really working through um, some, some illnesses, like that, that makes it that much harder, you know? And so, cause there are things that Kanye West are doing right now that I'm seeing at least on, because I have a lot of mental illness in my family that I'm seeing him do. I'm going, that's not, that's not the tweets of a healthy person. You know, like right. that is not the behavior of a healthy person. Like he actually, and that's where I, I would love to see more people extend grace to go like this guy's, I actually think he's in some ways sick and needs to be cared for. And we should be praying for that and, and not rushing him into this, to the front lines of this like Christian slash cultural conversation that he is not armed and ready for. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible space we live in. I'm happy that we're living and breathing today to still be able to talk about it. I think that you've uh, been leading great thoughts. Uh, thanks for taking some time here today just to discuss it's fun, man. Thanks the, for having me. the uh, array of topics that it happens to be with being young and trying to be cultured and being a yeah. Christian in this world. Uh, I have to say it, it is actually a blessed time to be alive. Yep. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be scary. And it, um, and I think it also comes with deep responsibility as well. Absolutely. You know, blessings, I think sometimes show up like burdens. They knock on the door of your life and it looks like a burden and it looks negative, but really it's, you know, it's, it's a blessing in disguise. And I really think we're going to come out of 2020 as crazy as it's been. Like we're all going to come out stronger and wiser. I love it. Well, in order to find Travis, it's, it's Canvas SF. Is, is that the Instagram to, to kind of get the best updates on what's happening within that community? Yeah, you can go Canvas underscore SF um, okay. on, on Instagram. And then uh, canvas-sf.com is our website as well. Cool. And then uh, Death to Someday. Yeah, so Death to Someday.com. And same Instagram, Death to Someday. Um, yeah, check it out. We have some free resources on there that maybe we'll start the conversation of like, what does it look like for you to, you know, begin living from vision and purpose. Uh, so, you know, go on there, download them. And uh, yeah, I'd love to also talk to you about what you're dreaming about. Uh, anything else you want to leave us with today? Oh, man, let's all be students. Let's just all continue to learn. Let's have open hearts, open minds. And because uh, I think we can learn from everybody. And uh, we need one another during this time. So um, yeah, I, I feel like that's what's been on my radar lately is like, let's just, we need each other to get through this. So let's, let's be humble and open. I love it. Well, God bless you all. Godspeed. Thank you so much. This was Purple Politics. I hope to see you next time. Travis, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it.